Thank you all for your presence here today. I know it's, um, it's sometimes challenging to take a step out and learn about a whole vast new horizon of information. Uh, I know personally, whenever I step out into a new domain, I realize exactly how much I didn't know uh, when I felt like I've already, I've been studying years, I've been living life years. How is it that I come across an entire domain of knowledge that I really don't know that much about? Um, many of you maybe in the room have a little working knowledge of Islam, so I hope that I can also add to whatever it is that, that you bring and we'll nuance it, it here. Okay. Do you have any idea, like guesses in the room? Don't don't be shy. What is this? What do you see in front of you? A menu. Oh, is that, is that an Arabic text? That is the, the, the basic profession of faith. Okay, great. And and what do you think the basic profession of faith? Great. Does anyone have a sense of what that would be? The basic tenet. Someone once asked me, can you just reduce Islam to like one sentence for me. There's a short. Exactly, exactly. Great. So we have a, a wonderful basis of working knowledge. Let me say that again. So here you have what's called in Arabic the shahada, which is the essential component of Islam. Everything else works on this, what's called shahada. And before I tell you what this is, let me tell you what shahada is. So shahid means to witness. As in, I testify that something. So you serve as a witness. But shahid also <clears throat> means a deeper level of experience. So simultaneously, the shahada is making a statement both about what you experience, in this case as a Muslim, but also a, a creedal statement, a statement of belief. So it serves as both simultaneously. And that is, la ilaha illallah, you see right here is the word for Allah, which we'll, I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that in a second. Muhammad Rasulullah. I bear witness, I testify, that there is no God, no deity, nothing worthy of worship except the God. And Allah, I'll put that word up in a second here, literally means the God. And so if you walk into a church in Egypt, you will open the prayer book and there will be Allah. <coughs> so I get questions frequently. Who is this Allah? Who is your God? As a, as a Christian, uh, as a Jew, um, as, as a monotheistic worshiper, it's Allah, the God. It's just the Arabic, uh, the particular Arabic word for God. <clears throat> so there is no deity, no nothing worthy of worship except for God. And Muhammad, is the messenger of God. Now, this is interesting. People might hear it as an exclusive statement, but Muhammad's message is a message affirming other prophets, including Jesus, including Moses, including Abraham, or Ibrahim, which is my uh, namesake, and, and many other, many of them biblical prophets, some of them people who were known in Arabia but are outside of the, the biblical uh, realm of, of discourse. So by saying, well, Muhammad Rasul, Rasul is a messenger. Okay, so this is, this is a key concept in Islam that Muhammad is not considered divine. Muhammad is a messenger that car who carries a message. Uh, and Jesus in the Islamic tradition is also a messenger. Moses, Musa, also a messenger. But by this statement, it not only says something about how Muslims orient towards Muhammad, but how they see peace and blessings on his name, but how they orient to all the other prophets, may peace be upon them. So, next slide. <clears throat> this is the basic, and again, these slides are up online, but just in case you, you didn't hear the first time, there is no God but God, and Muhammad is God's messenger. So there it is again, Allah, uh, and the word, this al in Arabic just means the, as I said, and in this last part, ilay is the word for God, and when you contract it, it becomes Allah, and what is ilay in, in Arabic? It's the thing that other people seek 
but is independent of all meaning. So it's the, 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 the thing that other people uh, uh, go to for help, essentially, for support, but that is, is totally free of meaning. And this is a core way of thinking about God in the Islamic tradition. God has many, many, many names that are mentioned in the Qur'an, the, the Holy Book of Islam, that are taught by Muhammad in his discourses to the people. Many names. Uh, the lover, the giver of peace, the, the, um, uh, the bestower of gifts. So, so many names. Also, more difficult names. The bringer of death. The constrictor, uh, you might think of it as the constrictor of hearts. Uh, so all, both, both dimensions and aspects of God, both as the loving and merciful, as well as the powerful and the mighty, these are all conceptions, names. Uh, they're often called attributes or qualities or aspects uh, of God. But these all are thought to describe a uni unity of being. Uh, is, is the fundamental idea of, about God. So you, you might be surprised to, to hear about this, that even if you pick up a Quran translation and uh, you see he is God, the one, the only, you're not uh, supposed to, as a Muslim, conjugate in your head any type of form or entity because the human mind is limited in such a way that however we perceive of uh, this, this being called God, we fall short of it. Uh, and definitely God is not in any way referred to as the Father in Islam. Never by the Quran, never uh, by, by the prophet's discourse, the scholars, it's, it's not, uh, not a part of the lexicon. Uh, and you might be interested to hear that God's names that are used most frequently, uh, Al-Rahman and Al-Rahim, my daughter's name is Rahma. Does anyone have an idea, Hebrew speakers or students, what the word Rahma, what that root might be? Mercy. Exactly. So all these mercy and compassion come from that, that word Rahma. And as well, the word for the moon. <coughs> comes from that root as well. So these are profoundly, if you will, these names, these qualities, these aspects of God that begin the Qur'an, that are repeated the most frequently throughout the Qur'an, they actually have a deep uh, link to something that is inherently uh, female. So there's this beautiful uh, feminine, if you, if you will, uh, uh, quality at the same time, you'll find many, many other names as well. So it's a, it's a, it's a. Uh, there's, there's much there, but never uh, when you hear he, when you hear the text uh, say he, or when you pick up a translation and see he, the Arabic uh, grammar and morphology is not such that he is always ontologically male. Uh, if you study French or Spanish, you understand that a chair has a gender. German, a chair has a gender, right? And so this is much the way it is with, with uh, Arabic. Yeah, I love you, 
Ideas for what you were just hearing? What do you think? Some of you probably know, but what were you just hearing? Start off with basics. What do you think? Guesses? Okay, it's the Quran, yes, yes. So the Quran, it, it's, so it's recited in this rhythmic yeah. voice, and both the, the, the young girl uh, and the, the older uh, gentleman here were reciting the same verses, but you, you maybe felt a different tonality from, from both of them. So Quran comes from the Arabic word that means to, to recite, essentially. Also, it means to, to read as in the sense of one might read a proclamation. So it's, it's this uh, performative act. So it's not merely reading as in we read novels, but it is, it is a performative act. And so the Qur'an, even as we might point to a book and say, this is the Qur'an, Muslims don't really understand it that way. The Qur'an is this particular recitation of over 6,000 verses. And they say, where is the Qur'an? Where is it? Uh, they say it's in the hearts of, of, uh, of people. And so that's first and foremost where it is. You'll hear people talk about the text of the Qur'an, but primarily when you think of Qur'an, think about this recitation, uh, if you will. Poetic in ways, uh, it, it contains stories. Uh, my favorite, uh, the Qur'an calls it the best of stories, the Joseph story in the Qur'an. Uh, stories that include uh, the first human beings, uh, Adam and Hawa, Adam and Eve, in, uh, in other words. Both, by the way, Adam is the word for dirt, like a specific kind of dirt in Arabic, and also Hawa is a different kind of dirt. There are also words for colors, like earthen colors. Uh, so every story, every word, every bit of the Quran it has these deep resonances. And so you'll find that scholars will spend <clears throat> their lifetime learn, learning all these subtle nuances of the Quran. Many young children commit it to heart, to commit it to memory. Uh, in, in, we have, uh, in our month of Ramadan, the community recites the Quran at, all the way through at least once, sometimes twice, sometimes more in different places around the world, such as in Morocco. They constantly, as a country, uh, recite the Qur'an once monthly. They complete the Qur'an. So it's a very much a, it's the, the basis, the bedrock for all of Islamic learning, and piety, and knowledge is the Qur'an. But it's really just the bedrock. And there's an entire intellectual, legal, spiritual tradition, uh, the prophetic tradition, all of his uh, peace and blessings be upon him, discourses, his uh, teaching moments, things that people reported about him, simple things. He used to enter the mosque always with his right foot. You know, just very subtle things. This whole body uh, is what, what is uh, Islamic knowledge. But the Quran is always the bedrock. And I'll, I'll say more about this as we go on. The verses that you heard were called the verses of the throne. And now, you know, again, we're thinking throne. You think of a person sitting on the throne. And these, these verses show you really well that the Qur'an is operating. It's giving us images that resonate with the human experience. So when we think of a throne, we associate certain things with the throne. Power and majesty, a person who's uh, there both to serve us, but that has... Uh, you know, to, that, that is in a particular relationship to us as a, as a master or a subject. And so there's all these, these things. But simultaneously, scholars will never, of the Qur'an, will never say, will say, there is such a thing as God's throne. The Qur'an talks about such a thing as God's throne. Now, how do we understand that as, as, uh, from our experience as humans? So there's always this play between never negating the Qur'an says God has a throne. God has a throne. Now what that looks like or means is where scholars get into you know, 14, almost 1,500 years now of, of debating things like that. Um, so you'll, you'll see people 
there's a there's an idea that Muslims take the are literalists and they take the Quran literally. And there's there's a sense about that. We do. If God has a throne, God has a throne. But then that declaration, the literal, opens up to a whole uh, figurative and metaphorical world. And every verse in the Quran has many, many multiple uh, interpretations. And that's considered by Muslims the beauty of it. And different passages will, if you read them next to other passages, open out new meanings. Uh, and so the, the Muslim scholars will read the different verses of the Quran. There's not a chapter on the chapter on God's throne that you find, you know, the seven statements about God's throne. No, the, the Quran, if you think about, you have to read a little bit here and piece it with a little bit that comes later. And, and it's an, uh, what, what we think about religious study folks as an exegetical invitation. Um, you'll find sometimes if you, if you pick up the Quran and you're expecting this is a book, you know, a book has chapters, a book starts in the beginning, a book finishes at the end. You won't find that in the Quran. It's a different, it's a different type of reading experience. The next slide. <clears throat> this is one of my favorite. We won't be able to get a whole lot into this presentation, but this is one of my, my very favorite verses in the Quran. I have many, of course. But this is one that's commonly cited in inter-faith, inter inter-religious context. Uh, and it says, Yeah, Yohannes, so, O oh, people. Ness is the most general category of people. So you see the Quran is talking to people. Sometimes it talks to specific groups of people. Sometimes it says, O oh, children of Israel. Sometimes it says, O oh, companions of the prophet. Sometimes it says, O oh, women. Sometimes it says, oh, men. So it has, the Quran is what uh, scholars refer to as self-aware. So it is aware that it is a discourse, mm -hmm. if you will. So, oh, people, inna ja'annakum. So we, I, uh, or we is actually the, the plural. It's, the, it's the, um, the royal we, if you will. But the, the, in the Quran, you hear God's discourse, and sometimes God says, I. I am closer to you than your jugular vein. Sometimes God says, we. We, and here it's, we created you. And you is the plural here. So, oh, oh, people, we created you from the Quran wa which is men and women, like a male, a male, here, not men, but a male and a female. And we made you nations and tribes. And this word here in the Arabic is like a purposeful act. This is, so in this verse, God is saying, we made you from men, from a male, from a male, from men, and from, from the female aspect. And we made you nations and tribes. So it's not an accident uh, that that human organization is as it is. Um, and, and it goes on, the verse is a little bit uh, cut off here, but it says the purpose, the purpose of that, okay, yeah, there, good. So this word is to come to know one another. And this is this word. And it's the word in Arabic, not the kind of know as in I read an encyclopedia article and now I know about, oh, uh, about Muslims, but no, this is to, to know a person. This is the intimate word. And it's the form in Arabic that means mutuality, so that you will know one another. And then it has a profound statement, right? After it talks about from women, from men, from nations, from different nations, from different tribes. And the best of you in the sight of God is the one that's most God conscious. Okay, so here is the Quran's leveling out. There's no gender hierarchies, there's no uh, <coughs> There's no, uh, my nation is better than your nation, my tribe is better than your tribe. It is a complete leveling out except for one quality, and that's God consciousness. So this is the Quran's kind of statement on valuing a human potential, if you will, or human ability to know God. It does not know any boundaries based on gender, based on class, based on ethnicity, nationality, nothing like that. It's only that degree of, of God consciousness. So you ask, well, how do you, um, oh, here's a great, 
we're going to have this. So the Quran has many different statements like this. this. That particular verse that I read for you was one of the most uh, compact and concise that I like. <clears throat> Indeed, the noblest of you in the sight of God is the most god worry among you. God is all-knowing, all-aware. And it also reminds these qualities of God being all-knowing, all-aware, also remind us that piety is not something that shows on the outside, but piety is something that God knows and is aware of deeply within our being. So there's a, there's a, and it's also, I think these verses are a negation that piety looks, looks any certain way because God is the all-knowing, all-aware. And it's also a reminder that people, uh, from the Quran perspective, don't judge one another, that God is the judge of, of what's inside people's uh, hearts. <laughs> Okay. These are a little small, so I'm going to skip over these because they don't project well. But I, I basically told you many things about the Quran. Next slide, Bob. You should know, uh, even even if you uh, if you just come to the Quran, it's a very confusing book, especially if you're reading it in translation, because the Quran is only the Quran in Arabic. Anytime you translate. The Qur'an, it's an interpretation. It loses uh, many, many, many layers of meaning, layers of nuance. You can't hear and experience it in English or any other language except the Arabic. But what you can know if you do, you know, as you engage with verses that I'm putting up, you can know that Muslims think about it as coming from God, but you can think about it as a, a book with a message or a a, uh, a recitation with a message. And if you read that, the Quran is profoundly uh, coherent and it, it uh, addresses uh, humanity. What? It has economic aspects and all types of social relations. Uh, but it also has a, a profound um, theology as well that engages with other theologies that came before it. So it has a lot to say about Christianity, about Christians. It has a lot to say about Judaism, about Jews. It has a lot to say of, um, it, it, it's, it, by virtue of that quality of being what I call self-aware, it situates, the Quran situates itself and speaks to the human context. But for Muslims, it's from God's point of view. Okay, so next. And we won't get through much of this because I want to stop for, for questions, but I might just end with this particular concept uh, and know that there's still so much to cover. But the basic premise of the Qur'an is that human beings come into the world with this uh, beautiful kind of pure state. So there's no concept of, of, uh, of original sin or, or any idea of that. The idea is that we as, as humans have different kind of programs, and we could run this uh, you know, great God-conscious program, but we also kind of are prone to getting distracted and to forgetting, and we have, we're in the world, we have you know, bodily needs, bodily desires, we want food, we want all kinds of other things, we want comfort, and that those desires can kind of get us off of the path of God-consciousness. So suddenly our bodies say, I'm a distinct body and I want comfort and I want land and I want rights and I want this. And then, and then you know, you slowly lead away from the idea that we are a humanity, that we are kind of in, in concert with one another. Uh, so this idea of fitra is the Arabic word for that inner essence, that beautiful perfection inside every person that absolutely has this clarity of thought is aware of the interconnections of humanity, uh, understands ethics, understands justice intuitively. So this is, if you want to translate it into English, it's the, almost the intuitive faculty of, 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 uh, of any person. In Fatra, it just comes from the word of God, uh, uh, the, the fashioner. So Fatra is to fashion in Arabic. And uh, it, it means that we're fashioned. We, you know, we have a body, we have uh, things we're fashioned in that sense, but we're fashioned with this uh, intrinsic con consciousness, this intrinsic, beautiful, complete, perfect God consciousness uh, that recognizes Tawheed. Now, Wahid is one in Arabic, and Tawheed is the recognition of unity. Uh, if, you, if you've uh, 
read about Buddhism, for instance, or Hinduism, or any of the, these philosophical insights that come from uh, that where, where uh, uh, spiritual perfection is in the recognition of interdependence and unity, this is a very similar concept that is absolutely at the foundations of Islam. So if you had to take away one thing from today, it's that Islam preaches the, the absolute utter unity of humanity, of existence, of, of creation. We are a part, obviously, of creation. And the, the, the underlying paradigm is that God's mark, God, by virtue of being a creator, God's mark is in, in all of the creation. Uh, so if you, you know, you have, maybe you have China, you turn it over and you look, what is the mark on the back of your China? Essentially, the whole universe is, you know, bears this mark of being a creation of God. And so that's the, the um, you know, essential bottom line paradigm of all things uh, Islamic, which leads to all kinds of social principles as well. Well, if you were, you know, have this divine, if you are, a, a creation of the creator, then there are certain ways that I must interact with you. Uh, if I'm a creation of the creator, there's a fundamental dignity inside me that's completely irreducible because I am a, 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 a creation of this, this majestic creator. So, let's see one more slide, but where was I going? <coughs> Okay, so let me go, last point here, the Tauhi, what it means, and that this, uh, this recognition of oneness, Bob, did you, you can hit it a few times. <clears throat> okay, there you go. So, it goes right back to the Shahada, there is no thing worthy of worship, devotion, attention, energy, uh, you know, the direction, other than God. Uh, God is the origin of all things, uh, the, the Muslim philosophers will say, is there a God is not the question. The question is, who created all of this? Uh, so that's, that's the idea that God is the origin of the entire cosmos and many things we don't know, we don't have any knowledge of. Uh, all things continually exist through God. So this is not the idea that, that God created and then things just keep going without God. The idea is that God is the only necessary being. So we are all what, what philosophers call contingent beings. That is, if, there's, if God wishes us out of existence, we cease to exist. So all of our reality at every moment is a deep per, due to this uh, creative act of, of the creator. So all things will return to God. And in the Arabian times when Islam emerged, this was a fundamentally bizarre principle that, that uh, all things, the world, the physical world that we see it, everything goes back to God, because with the power of creation is also the power of destruction. So all things, our bodies, are pre-programmed to age, to die. The, we, we see you know, even a majestic tree that's 400 years old it dies, everything. So this is the idea that all things uh, return to God. And God is the only source of truth and reality. One of the names of God, this is where I'll end, is El Haq, which means just like the, the reality, the thing that exists. So there's no uh, existence itself outside of God. It's, you know, these are profound kind of theological, philosophical uh, ideas, but that is the basis uh, of Islam. That's Islam 101 in 15, 20 minutes here. <laughs> And I know, I know there's many questions in the room, and, and I know particular, particularly the images that people might have, uh, you know, they're so uh, deeply disturbing, that, you know, the images that are connected with Islam, the, you know, I'll, I'll call them the lots of lies out there. I mean, things that I read and hear and see, and I'm just shocked, like, as if I said to you, this is a cup of coffee. Well, I mean, if you pour it into a coffee machine and add coffee grinds, and, okay, you know, some, this is the kind of uh, you know, twisting and distortion. Uh, so, I, you know, I, I just want to say I appreciate your presence and your patience and somehow your willingness to unlearn, because even if we watch something or see something and cognitively don't subscribe to it, the, the truth is we're neurologically wired. We've processed that thing in some way. 
And so we're kind of, kind of cluttered with, with a lot of these images, even if we didn't willingly uh, allow ourselves to be part of that, the paradigm. So I, I sincerely, sincerely appreciate uh, your presence. And well, I'll, take, I'll take some questions, and I'm sensitive that we have about 10 minutes. <laughs> What do you think is a good way for, for us to continue to learn about Islam? Is there a good ongoing way for people interested to learn more? Mm -hmm. Is it something online? Is it some yeah. course we can go to? So I'll pass around. These are some of my favorite uh, Learn Islam books. And I'll just pass them through. And I'm going to leave some of them with you uh, today. But if you're interested in learning, this is a local woman from Newton who made this fantastic sugar comes from Arabic, you know, as does camel and algebra and all of these other words that are part of our civilization. This is like a $10 book with Barnes and Noble. It goes through the tenets of Islam, uh, the basics of, of Islamic civilization from the 7th century through to the present times. Beautifully illustrated. Uh, this, uh, I'll pass this one around as well. These are two uh, sections from the Holy Quran and prayers of supplication. I love using these in audiences because people will flip through them. This sounds really familiar. Wow, I didn't know the Quran said this. You know, it's one of one of these things where, where if you flip through it and uh, it's it's uh, little prayers that are part of uh, Islamic devotions and things. But those are some some of the material. So there is this aspect of. You know, read and learn and go out there and, and, and seek things. But a lot of learning, and it goes back to that verse I'm projecting, is that that mutual learning from one another. So you know, if I'm learning about Islam from a book, I'm not really maybe getting at the kernel of it until I see something about what it means for another human being in their life. So there's no other substitute for getting to know people. Um, but, but there, the more you the more you have basic literacy, the better that you're able to relate to, to other people because you can ask the questions that might elicit from them a profound thinking and, and a profound personal response. Thank you. Yeah, I'm curious. Uh, I'm noticing a lot of similarities between God and like, the theology of God and Islam and Judaism. And Judaism and God is, Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, noting the similarities between God and Islam and Judaism, and I'm wondering if in Judaism God is understood to be impersonal, right? They're not a person, they don't have like a face, and they don't talk to you in the way that a person does, right? Is that similar in Islam as well? So I've learned, because I work in a rabbinical school, so I don't say anything about what Jews think about anything. <laughs> <laughs> But I will say, I will say that there is an idea that that this Creator God is profound because everything you see, know about, hear about, anything is is part of this creation. But you are also part of that creation. So there's a sense that this is an intimate, personal, knowable in a sense, uh, knowable God. But yet, you, this personal knowing it. It has to take into account that, that whatever you know is uh, very short, you know, just just by virtue. Uh, and it takes, there's no clergy, you might have realized this in Islam, and the two qualities of what makes a person an authority in Islam are knowledge and piety. You know, and of course there's sociological things that factor into that, but in the pure pure paradigm, in the theory of Islam, it's, it's your knowledge and your paradigm your piety and those go uh, together because the more the more you you have to know things to put them into practice but you have to practice things to know them at a more intimate level and it's the same there's a, a saying uh, from the 12th century scholar who says you know, the one who knows uh, himself or the one who knows herself knows her Lord and it's that sense that you you have inside you by virtue of that that uh, innate knowing the ability to 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 know like profound truths about God, reality, existence. Yeah. So that's the idea. It's, it's both personal and so much more. And then we'll take one more so that we can officially stop right on time. I'll try to keep this short because I know everybody needs to go. Christians and Jews in the modern world have had to struggle with the fact that their holy book appears to endorse things like blood vengeance against those of other faiths 
slavery, and the oppression of women. One of the ways we have dealt with this in, in Christianity and Judaism is to acknowledge that those holy books are the products of human endeavor that reflect as much as anything else the, the understandings of their times. One of the reasons we can do this is that we have things like the Dead Sea Scrolls and the you know fragments and, and, and original, not original, but manuscripts that allow us to trace the evolution of those. Is, is, is there a similar problem with the Quran and is there a similar way of dealing with it? The last part of this slide shows you early uh, Quran documents and things, so that's exactly where I could have gone there. <laughs> How do you see some of the early folios? Well, the Quran comes down in its entirety. We have Quran manuscripts that date from this early period. That's just years. You know, the, it, the early Muslim community, hundreds, 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 uh, maybe even close to thousands of people knew the Quran and had it as a working in their memories. They were Arabs. They were living in a desert. They weren't, not a whole lot of them uh, knew how to write and things, so the, the poetry and the oral was the, the bedrock of their culture. So people just knew the Quran, it was a thing. There was no period of redaction, there was no, um, no it, it's very different than the history of the biblical texts or, or the Christian testament in that way. Uh, to your other question, the problem that we have among Muslims, it's just Muslims acting badly. <laughs> and that, I mean, other, uh, obviously other religions and cultural complexes have that as well. But if people were actually just following the Quran, they'd be really wonderful human beings. Um, and, and so it's not so much a, it's not, there's not really so much a need to reread as to read in the first place, to really learn. Uh, and, and there's, um, <clears throat> Sometimes people ask me, you know, when, when will the Muslims have their reformation? Uh, and, and it really, it, it has a lot to do with the fact that people, uh, not, they're not learning the Islamic knowledge uh, for many, many different reasons. But there's, it's very hard to find uh, very uh, literate Muslims these days. And uh, even you know, as someone, I'm, I'm one of the people who does a lot of teaching about Islam, which uh, and my, my colleagues and I laugh about this, is that on the spectrum of where knowledge in Islam used to be, we are maybe three or four year olds in terms of our what we've mastered in, in text, in understanding, and putting it into practice. And so there's this just tremendous uh, dearth of knowledge among Muslims themselves about their sacred sources. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.